how can you manage Google Apps and Services, and why should you? Well, we'll cover that in this video. Hi, and welcome to our tutorial series on how to master the Google Admin Console. My name is Leon. I work for Cloudwise, the creators of the Cool School platform. Here at Cool, we try and help schools on how to use IT within education. And within this series, we would like to share our knowledge and experience with you on how to set up the Google Admin Console for your school. In this specific video, we will cover how you can set up and manage your Google Apps. We will cover the basics in this video, but there will certainly be videos later down the line where we cover certain apps in more detail and what you could do to change the way they work. Okay, so if you want to manage the Google Apps, we have to go to Apps. Now, uh, we see apps here in our dashboard. We go to Apps. You'll find that there are several types of apps or things that we can manage. For today in this video, I will mostly cover the Google Workspace settings. You'll find that many of those and the way that you manage them are the same as additional Google services. The difference between them are that the Google Workspace is a list of all the apps, the core apps that are available. So these are Gmail, Google Drive, Classroom, etc. While the additional Google services are the functionalities that also are available to consumers. You also see that there are other options like web and mobile apps, Google Workspace, Marketplace apps, but for now I will simply cover Google Workspace core services. In this overview, we see a list of all the available core apps that we could manage within the Google Admin Console. And the only thing really that we see here is whether or not they are currently on for everyone, on for some, or if they are currently disabled. Now, currently, it shows the status for all organizational units, meaning that if we go to a specific organizational unit, for example, within District A, we want to change something, I could click on District A or maybe on a individual school to see what the current status is of a service for that level. If it is a level underneath the root layer, we will also be able to see whether or not it will inherit any of the settings that are currently set on the layer above it. Now, currently in this district, every service is currently still set to on, uh, simply showing that nothing has been changed here really, but perhaps they have made any changes on lower organizational unit layers. So I'm going to show you how to turn them on or off. And after that, I'm going to explain why you may want to do that. So when we go to turning one of these services off for a specific organizational unit, please do again, make sure that we go to the right organizational unit first. So for example, I want to go to students of school A and I want to turn off a Gmail. I click on Gmail and then I turn it to off. And I confirm this. Now you can see that the service has been changed to off for the Gmail service. So why would we want to do this in the first place? So, of course, all these core apps are in general very useful, but there may be certain situations, and we've seen that specifically and in particular with school organizations, that you may want to prohibit the use of certain services for a group of users. And this does not have to be only students, of course. This can also mean that you want to exclude certain staff uh, from certain services as well. And again, this really shows how important it is to have a proper organizational unit structure in the first place so that you can set these limitations or services and any of the other settings you may want to change on a particular level. Now, the use case where you may want to turn off Gmail is when for the younger students, specifically within primary education, you don't need it. You're not going to use Gmail to communicate with the students. You won't use Gmail as a way of enhancing your learning journey uh, combined with IT, because maybe you will simply use Google Classroom for that, or you have a different platform to communicate with students anyway, which is a lot more accessible. So 
another reason why you may want to turn it off is actually when you find that besides the reasons I already mentioned just now, you don't really make use of it with students. You want to completely prohibit students also being contacted in some way or form by uh, them contacting their peers, you know, other students, or maybe from external parties. Now, I'm not saying that is the best way to go about it every single time because we can also set certain settings specifically for Gmail so that emails sent to uh, students, for example, are only allowed to uh, actually be delivered when they have been sent from within the organization, but not when they are sent by an external party. But these things often require more knowledge and a more in-depth setting to be done, which adds complexity to your overall solution. But the same goes, as an example for Gmail, for chat or for other things. Maybe you don't want students to have access to uh, things like Vault or the Google search. And maybe you just want to use one or the other Google Assignments or Google Classroom, given the fact that they have overlapping capabilities and functionality, maybe you really want to just stick with one of the two for your organization. So what are the things that are relevant to know about uh, what kind of settings you could do for the specific Google core apps? Now, if we, for example, take a uh, classroom right here. So I go to classroom and then I see here that the service currently is on for everyone, but we also have some options, some general settings class settings and data access, originality reports, and school data sync. Um, I won't go through all of them in this video, but let's take the general settings as an example. So here we uh, can tell who can actually create a new classroom, who can create a new class. Normally, as you uh, undoubtedly know, the moment that you visit classroom for the first time, that will mean that the student or the teacher can decide whether or not they are a teacher or a student. So the moment that a student would choose, yes, I'm a teacher, they would immediately also be added to the classroom teachers group. Now, the thing here is that we can actually change this. So if I go here, I can say, no, only verified teachers can actually create a new class. What would that mean? Now, as it is displayed here, users who claim to be teachers during sign up are added to this group, the classroom teachers group, as pending members. Now, that would mean that someone would have to manage that Google group and uh, accept the pending members who are actually teachers, so that everyone who is an actual member of the Google group will be added to the list of people who can actually create a Google Classroom. This is one uh, very powerful way to actually prohibit students from creating Google Classrooms if that is not what you want within your organization. Another interesting setting that we can find here is the Guardian Access. So Guardian Access is something that allows the teachers or whoever actually has access, of course, add email addresses to a student. These are then assigned guardians. The great thing about the Guardian functionality is that when we have filled in those email addresses, these people will be updated automatically based on their own preferences. The first time they will get a request, uh, how often do you want to be updated? Instead of the teacher now having to call or, or email them with all the results of how the student was doing uh, in terms of what kind of uh, assignments are still uh, pending, what assignments were handed in, what kind of results were there, uh, but also if they were too late with handing something in, and of course, they failed a certain test, then those things will be automatically sent periodically based on what the guardian actually wants to have. And this setting specifically goes into who can actually set up and add new guardians to a student. By default, it will be set to only domain administrators. So that's actually a pretty good thing to know. Because if we say all verified teachers can actually add guardians to a student, then they don't have to ask you to actually go to classroom, go to the student and actually add the email addresses. Instead, what we can do here is have the teachers add those email addresses of the guardians themselves. Another very important one, I feel like for classroom in particular, is um, membership. Now, the thing with classroom in this case is that we can set who can join our classes, but also who can we join, our accounts join, in a different classroom. So this is actually 
pretty important. Why? By default, if we have our own school organization, then there's no problem. Then the default settings are fine. But if we go into who can join in your domain, it now says any G Suite user. Of course, Google Workspace is what it's called now. But any G Suite user means that any professional Google account will be able to uh, join a Google Classroom. While by default, this will be set to users within your domain only. What this means is that now, if I would create a classroom, I would invite you. If you have a Google Workspace environment for education or any other, you will be able to join my classroom in this environment. If within your organization, it has been said that you can actually join a Google Classroom in a different domain. So this goes both ways. Not only do I, in my domain, need to set whether or not I allow guests to join our classrooms, at the same time, we also would need to set up whether or not our users can join another classroom that is not managed within their own domain. And this is something that is overlooked quite often. And uh, we find that if a uh, district uses separate G Suite or Google Workspace domains, then we find that this is one of the things that is encountered as an issue due to the fact that maybe you have students that visit another school and join classes there instead of everything being handled within one Google environment. But the same also goes for when you have just guest students from a completely different district that want to follow certain classes within your school. Maybe they don't even have a Google Workspace environment on that school that they are originally from. Then if you want them to be able to join with, for example, a normal Gmail account, then we would have to allow any user to be able to join any of our classes to uh, allow them access. That basically already covers the kind of settings we can do with Classroom. But for now, there are still a lot of apps I would still like to go through uh, but we will cover those in a later video. For example, Drive and Document settings, Google Calendar settings, but also Gmail settings. In particular, Gmail settings, I feel like, will still be a very large topic to talk about. We may actually take some of those subjects and add them to the specific parts that we will talk about in regards to setting up security for your organization. But for now, you know, how we can turn on or turn off a service for an organizational unit and why you may want to do so. But you also know that we can select any of these apps and see if there are any things that we may want to change about how the service works within our Google Workspace environment. If you found this video helpful, let us know by liking the video and subscribing to our channel. If you don't want to miss out on any of our future updates and uploads, also make sure that you turn on the notifications. We plan on doing an upload every week, so stay tuned for more short how-to videos on how to master the Google Admin Console. For now, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.